Effective control in accounts payable boils down to one simple thing, the details. I've identified a baker's dozen of places where controls often go awry in the accounts payable process and will explain how this happens when it's often not that obvious at first glance. Make sure you stick around until the end when we discuss the one control weakness many have but don't realize until they are hit with a massive fraud and it's too late then. While it's great to be a big picture person there is and there's definitely a place for that ignoring the details and your profits go out the door let me explain control weaknesses especially internal controls are the tiny cracks in your foundation and as you know tiny cracks become bigger cracks and if not taken care of can bring a whole entire building down in the business world this means losses which sadly will grow and have the potential to eventually torpedo the financial viability of your organization when criminals recognize them and take advantage. Let's get started looking at the promised baker's dozen of control weaknesses, including those that many don't realize they have. Control weakness number one, ineffective training. When you hire someone, especially when you hire someone to work in accounts payable, you need to train them on how you want to do things. If you don't, they'll do things the way either they think they should be done or the way they did them at their old company. Either of those may be fine, but they may not be fine. And inevitably, they will introduce weaknesses into your process, which will result in duplicate payments, duplicate invoices, uh, being paid twice, and other control problems. Control weakness number two, not using a coding standard. Now, many think people, no, not many, some people think that as we are moving towards automation, the use of a coding standard or requiring that your folks use a coding standard when they're entering data in the, in the accounts payable is not important anymore. It is because even those companies that are highly automated in their accounts payable function still have a certain amount of data entry and that you don't want your processes introducing errors into your system because they didn't use the coding standard when they are uh, entering the data on those few items whether they are resolving discrepancies or they're handling those few invoices that were not sent in through your automation process so you still need that coding standard control weakness number three not standardized your process for handling invoices when you're getting them ready for payment. By standardizing your processes, that means that if an invoice comes in a second time and you handled it the first time and I get it the second time, if I'm doing the exact same steps, I'll quickly recognize that this is a duplicate and I won't set it up for payment a second time. So standardize your processes. Not only that, when you standardize your processes, you can make sure that all the controls that need to be in place are in place and you don't stand the risk of somebody missing an important step. Hey guys, I just realized I didn't introduce myself. I'm Mary Schaefer, founder of this channel and the AP Nail Podcast, which now has over 600 episodes. And I hope when you're done with this one, when you finish with this one, you'll listen to a few others or watch a few others. I've also written over 20 business books, most focusing on business and accounts payable issues. But enough about me. Let's go on to and talk about control weakness number four, which is not using that coding standard in the mess to vendor file when you're setting up new vendors. Um, it's just as important and maybe even more important that you use this coding standard that should match your invoice coding standard so that um, when vendors are set up in the master vendor file, your processes will be able to easily find them and they'll be able to match them to the invoice and you don't end up with duplicate vendors in the master vendor file because that is a prime way that uh, fraud is facilitated, number one, and number two, uh, that invoices get get processed twice okay so use the coding standard when setting up vendors both new and when you're making changes in the vendor file control weakness number five allowing multiple people to make changes in the master vendor file now we haven't talked about appropriate separation of duties and don't worry you're not going to get through this without me doing that but when it comes to master vendor file there should be a person who is responsible for that or two people if you're a large enough organization and no one else should be going in the master vendor file. Too often we'll see a processor going in and making like an address change or a bank account change. You don't want to do that because then you have you know, too many hands in the pie, not appropriate separation of duties. So make sure that all changes 
changes to the master vendor file are made by the person who's responsible for it and no one else has the ability to do it. Even not, not only that they're not supposed to do it on a regular basis, but they don't have the ability to do it. Because if they do and they are a devious mind, they could go in and make changes that would result in a fraudulent payment. Okay, along the same lines, control weakness number six, not regularly cleansing the master vendor file so that you get rid of inactive vendors, vendors that you are not doing business with anymore. You don't want to get rid of that information. You just want to deactivate their, their entries so that nobody can use that, that file, that inactive file, if you will, to uh, push through a, a fraudulent payment. So regularly cleanse the master vendor file. Otherwise, it just also it gets too big and unwieldy, especially if you had a lot of one-time vendors in there, which some people put in and some don't. But I'm getting off topic and let me get back. Topic two, control weakness number seven, not doing a periodic review of how your processes are doing their work to ensure that they haven't introduced shortcuts, which also introduce weaknesses into the system. Not to say that all shortcuts will introduce weaknesses. Some of them will be true shortcuts and a benefit for everyone. But oftentimes what the shortcut does is it makes the person who, who creates it, makes their job a little easier, makes their job go a little faster. But at the same time, it does that. It can either creates a control weakness someplace else within the process or creates a problem for somebody else. So you want to, if they have a shortcut, if they have a suggestion for a shortcut, that's great. You want to sit down, you want to talk to them about it. And if it is truly a good idea, then everybody should use it, not just them. And But oftentimes, as I say, when you review it and you can see the big picture, remember I told you there's a place with big picture of folks. Uh, when you can see the big picture, you'll realize that this, this is not a good change. And then you can explain to them why it's not a good idea where the problems would co would come. Okay, control weakness number eight, understanding vendor credits. Now, if you're the manager, you probably understand vendor credits very well, and you will recognize them uh, very well also. But if you're new to accounts payable or new to accounting, or even if you're not new, if nobody's ever explained them to you, you the staff probably won't recognize the vendor credit and more importantly, won't know what to do with it. So when a vendor credit comes through, because they often do look like uh, invoices, they will go ahead and pay it. So you want to make sure they understand vendor credits, they know what to do with them, and um, of course you want to try and collect as many of these as you can because that's money owed your company and you should get it back. Control weakness number nine, employee, em, em, not employing verification routines so that you don't pay a supplier twice. First of all, if you pay somebody twice, you know, by mistake, it happens. Number one, in all likelihood, they won't return the money. They may issue a vendor credit. They may not issue a vendor credit. Even if they do issue a vendor credit, they may, you may or may not get it. There's a, a variety of reasons for that. But even worse than all that is there are a few suppliers out there who if you pay them twice, they'll say, hmm, these guys don't have their act together. Uh, maybe I'll try and get them to pay us twice more frequently. And that is what they will do. So you want to employ routines to make sure you don't pay uh, twice. You want to do some verifications and then you want to do some after the fact checking. Now, before we get to our last few control weaknesses, I'd like to request that if you're getting any value from this, that you hit that thumbs up or like button. It helps us get wider distribution on our talks, which in turn provides us with the necessary collateral to make more talks like this to help you. Control weakness number 10, um, vendor inquiries, not taking them seriously. Um, you want to make sure that you understand all the calls that are coming in from your vendors. Sometimes you'll have vendors who will try and manipulate, manipulate your processes. They'll either bully them into paying them twice. Uh, uh, a few of them will. Um, of course, they don't say pay me twice. They'll pretend that they haven't been paid at all and then try and get the processor to uh, issue a second payment without spending the appropriate time verifying that the first payment may, was, wasn't made. And the second thing that occasionally you'll see a vendor doing is they will try and get a processor to pay them early. Uh, and while that's certainly not nowhere near as damaging as having somebody pay twice, 
this, it is uh, not in the best interest of your organization and they shouldn't be doing it. So they'll either pull on their heartstrings, you know, oh, I need the money, or they'll they'll say something, oh, that payment was supposed to go out or whatever. They just kind of cajole the process into, into paying them early and you don't want this. I could talk a lot more about that, but, but I won't. You get where I'm going. Okay, control weakness number 11, not requiring mandatory vacations. Every organization should have a policy that anyone who has anything to do with their money takes five consecutive days off during which time somebody else does their job um, and they are out of the office. You don't want them being out of the office, being working from home, and then doing their job from home because that negates what you're trying to achieve. What you want to make sure is that there's no fraud going on, actually, but you really don't want to say that. Um, and so somebody else does the job and the feeling is that within the five days, if there was an ongoing fraud, that um, it would become uncovered. Now, many companies don't have this this policy uh, mainly because they are you know people take take all their vacation time but you don't want someone even though I understand why they might like to do it if they get 10 week if they get two weeks vacation taking you know every Friday in the summer off and they just have some long weekends because they didn't plan to go anyplace well that's nice it doesn't cover you on your five consecutive days off so you, you want to do that control weakness number 12 I promised it was coming not employing appropriate separation of duties. And this is getting harder and harder for more companies as our accounts payable departments use more and more technology and they get smaller and smaller. It becomes harder and harder to employ appropriate separation of duties. But if you don't, you will end up or you could end up with a situation where a person has um, access to two legs of a transa transaction and if they have a, a devious heart, then they are more apt to uh, make it easier for them to, to commit for it if that's how they are so inclined. And while most of your people absolutely will not do that, you don't know who will. And in fact, that brings me to control weakness number 13. I call it the myth of the long-term trusted employee. Most employees who've been with you for a long time are very honorable. So I don't want to give you the uh, impression that there's not, but there are a few who use their uh, position of trust, if you will, to have the uh, appropriate separation of duties. They're not in place uh, and they have access to more things than they could and a few of them will take advantage and rob, rob their uh, employer and in, in fact in most cases where there is an internal fraud especially when that internal fraud is due, due to um, inappropriate separation of duties or weakened internal controls it will turn out that it's a long-term trusted employee who uh, has taken, taken advantage because they know where the weaknesses are and you've kind of let your guard down and you're not checking them as much as maybe you're checking that new employee or that guy who you think he looks a little shady, even though he doesn't, he's a perfectly um, nice guy. So that's why I call it the myth of the long-term trusted employee. So your internal controls across the board, no exceptions, no matter how long someone's been with you and how much you trust them where you think they are honorable. So it will probably come as no surprise to you to learn that effective controls and accounts payable go hand in hand, if you will, with best practices. You literally cannot have one without the other. That's why we've done several best practice talks, which you can watch right now using the link that has appeared on your YouTube screen and is in the description. Good luck.